urgency. Change, brave. In the UK, we're facing a systemic challenge, whether it's energy, our food systems, how we as society make decisions, all the way through to even actually how we develop and build the environments for humans to develop and thrive. So this is an important moment to start having some real honest conversations, not to be afraid of them, but as an invitation to invite us to be our bigger self. If not now, then when? We can see with the multiple interconnected systemic crises that we face, they're all coming to a head and we haven't got time to waste or wait. So right now, the way we do philanthropy, the way we invest, the way our economic and financial system operates is designed to support an existing system. We must rethink how the, the flows of money operate in the world in order for us to rebuild or redesign, not rebuild, redesign institutions for the type of society we have today. There's a whole stack of systems that we inherited that we're using every day and they're breaking, right? They're, they're obsolete. They were designed for a different age around for different values, for different challenges, with different technologies. And so what clearly falls on our generation is to redesign some of those systems. We've had an economic ideology and model that is extractive and exploitative for the last 50 years. Um, and that has to end and that has to change. We need to imagine a new e economic model. And so the role of foundations in all of that is to try and incubate, catalyze new models um, for the future. Capital flows are hugely, hugely influential. And if we can change those capital flows, not to be extractive and not to be exploitative, then we will have done a massive amount of good. The biggest form of wealth by a mile is property rights. The one thing that we could transform tomorrow in the UK, and I would say this because we're working on it, <laughs> or you know, and many others are as well, um, it would be changing the way that we own land. Groundswell. Transformation. Decentralised finance. Part of the problem that we have is a lot of these communities and are not allowed to fail, right? Because they can't afford it. And so we need to give them the structures or the infrastructure and the funding they need to test solutions, iterate, fail, and learn from that. What's the scaffolding that's needed in order to support, um, whether that's individuals in an organization to kind of step into the kind of imagination and creativity and hope that's needed for the future, whether that's community organizations and what's the type of resourcing they need, what are the networks and uh, capacity building that they need. I think what's missing and what does need to change is just recognizing that actually some of the people who are best placed to do transformative work in their communities just need to get paid. They just need a salary to be able to keep doing what they're doing. You can show real value and real change through actual practice. And you don't necessarily want to scale that, you want to spread it. So we keep on talking about scale, but actually we always talk about spread. What comes to mind right now is the need for us to work less in competition and less in silos, but together and collectively. I think change doesn't happen in the boxes that funders often put themselves into or put the community groups and civil society organisations they work with into. If we could start thinking in more intersectional ways, if we could start thinking in more complex and systemic ways, in longer term ways, but that address what the needs that are happening on the ground, then this would be unlocking a whole world of possibilities for change. Taking this forward within the community of foundations and change makers who've been assembled here at, at the conference, um, I mean, this will happen to some extent organically, but um, could move faster with some structure um, that facilitates collaborative action and messaging. And my hope is that this conversation continues um, and does translate into more action as well. Collaboration. Determined. Unusual alliances. The three big questions that I use to try and anchor some of my work are, um, how do we ensure that all of our work centers the dignity of all living being? How do we shift who we're accountable to um, as opposed to who's in power to communities and to, to the to liberation movement? And how do we really think deeply about who we're in relationship with? What is the higher order accountability 
towards which we have to hold ourselves and each other accountable right now, starting from yesterday, because we don't have time to muck about. And unless we set our sights on an appropriate threshold, multi-generational, planetary as well as human, addressing structural inequity, etc., we are not going to meet the challenges that are set before us now. We just can't. Lots of people are talking about shifting power and you know shifting resources, and of course that is really important. But what does it actually mean for the sector? And more to the point, what does it actually mean in our economy, in our society? Who has power? What does it mean? What does it look like? Where does it need to go? Who doesn't have power? What does that look like? And how do we begin to build structures and environments whereby we can identify what power is needed and, and begin to figure out strategically how that power is shifted? How do we think outside of nation states? How do we build institutions? What, what do global institutions look like that account for all of us as peers that we share a planet. Liberation, cosmic possibility. Reimagine philanthropy. The key achievements so far, so we're only midway. Um, first, a collective sense of urgency among foundations around the need for change. I think that's very clear. Um, there's also the, the highlighting of what are the priority areas for change. And finally, showcasing examples of what a different future might look like, and that's been very, very powerful. If philanthropy chooses to, it can be at the vanguard of the experimentation and practice of, you know, what are the systems and tools that we need to build that beautiful, flourishing future for ourselves and the planet that we all dream of. Everything we need is already here, right? All the land, all the technology, really most of the technology, all of the people, all of the knowledge that we need to live in a fairer, more sustainable world is already here. A lot more people, a lot more groups have access to the technology they need to test, iterate, play around with different solutions to the crises that we have. The solutions to the problems that we have today are not going to be top down, they're going to be bottom up. And so by putting money, resources, and technology in the hands of grassroots groups, we're able to propel forward the solutions that we need. One of the things that I feel really hopeful about is the future generations, the way that they organize, the way that they relate to one another, the way they stand in solidarity with one another's causes, I find super inspiring and super hopeful. And I do think that our new modes of communication have allowed that, have allowed good ideas to spread across borders between groups and allowed us to find communities even when we feel like we're isolated. And that makes me feel really hopeful. It's the people behind movements that really have the power to drive change. I feel really hopeful about the ideas that are being shared and that the, 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 there are platforms that are being created. The hope comes from people and communities trying to break down inequity um, and who are using really incredible innovation to do that. What would the world look like if we really believe that every human being or every living being has deep kind of magic and potential within them and created systems to enable that potential to emerge. How would our workplaces change? How would our families change? And what comes out of it in a very small but very powerful way is our ability as a generation who bears so much responsibility for what we're seeing now, being able to show our children that among us are people who are not taking this at face value and saying things can't be changed, but they're taking it upon themselves to sow the seeds that will grow into that future that all of our children deserve. I don't think we have a choice of failure either. There is no other way. I think this is a paradigm shift for all of humanity and our relationship mm -hmm. with the planet and our relationship with technology. So I don't sit there with dread, I sit, this, sit there with a massive opportunity. And I think we have to embrace the possibility of what the future heralds for us. And yes, there, if we don't do it, there are risks, no doubt they are. But we sit forth with a massive opportunity to reimagine ourselves.